All right. Well, here we are, the Points Facebook page, and I am um, I'm really thrilled for this one today. Um, the lead singer of the Airborne Toxic event, Mikel Jolet, uh, joins us now. Uh, first of all, did I get your name correct? Because I've been freaking about uh, out about that for a couple of days. No, that's exactly right. Thank all you. right. Awesome. Well, I want to show everybody here. The book is called Hollywood Park. And, you know, Mikel, normally when I when I when I start an interview and I'm the process of preparing for an interview, the first questions that pop into my mind normally are not, I wonder if I can ask him about his brother and his mom. <laughs> you know, like, like, how are they doing? It's, it's just after reading that book, Mikel, it was so personal. It's, it's one of those things, man, where I feel like I kind of know you a little bit. I know I don't, but no, I it's just so revealing. Was it hard to be that revealing? Because you talk about everything, man. I mean, you leave no stone unturned, making you look good and 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 bad at times, for sure. Well, yeah, well, I mean, I think that's the province of, of, of what I'm doing. Like, it's not really fair to the reader if I have an agenda of some sort. So it, the, the, whole, the whole point was to try to be agendaless and to try to let, you know, the difficult uh, relationships also be written with great love and then the sort of examine, self-examination be written with the same kind of eye towards the truth and the prodding of the truth. Because I feel like if there's an agenda in a book like this that you know it immediately, and the reader knows it immediately, and they're just right. like, shut up, dude. You know? Right. I don't need to read this because the story's already been told. Right. You know what I mean? You know? And, well, and just so like, here's, is- here's a basic form of bullshit. That's the other thing. They'll just be like, oh, this guy's bullshitting me. It's like, why is he so mean to this person? Why is he trying to make himself look good? Like, I think if you do that, then immediately people are turned off because people aren't stupid. They, you know, that stuff's pretty easy to see through, I think. Absolutely. And, you know, one, another thing that I read, and, and this was in a Billboard article that you did a few weeks ago where you said, you know, a lot of times when people are writing a record after a tragedy, writing a book after a tragedy movie, then, and it's like they're a kind of thing for them. For you, you said this was not that way, correct? Well, it was like I was trying to write. I was trying to, I mean, my, my first concerns... And my last concerns concerns are all with storytelling um, and the structure and the voice. And I think it's true that writing helped me to order the chaos that I was living through. You know, it's the death of family members and the grief and depression. I, I guess it's an attempt to make sense of it. But um, but I, I, that isn't why I did it. I did it because I wanted to write a you know I wanted to write a book. I wanted to write a, I wanted to write a good book. Well, um, you have absolutely done that. I, I mean, I. I that I so I started reading this before the whole pandemic thing even even started, and the book I read before yours was The Beastie Boys, and that was like my favorite band of all time. Yeah. So I started reading your book, and I was like, I'm not sure where I am here. And yeah. then it starts to talk about your story, and, and I just couldn't put it down, man. It was like four or five days where I'm, you know, I'm trying to find excuses. I'm hiding in the bathroom away from the kids so I can get a couple of extra pages in. That's yeah. like the highest compliment that I can give anybody. It just That's got to be kind of so riveting. At, at what point in your life did you, did you realize, well, we were in a cult. And we got out like like I'm sure you heard those words. But when did you really know what that meant? I think um, probably around college. I mean, I we, we grew up. So I, we left the cult when I was still very young. Right. Um, and, you know, when we were in the cult, uh, I only have a few memories of it, which is why most of the book, very little of it takes place in the cult. Cause I didn't want to bullshit the reader. Like, here's how I remember. Yes, yeah, I was very young. I have like three memories and they're all in the book. And a lot of my experience with it was trying to piece it together as I got older. Um, and I and I realized um, that I was being told a, a lie. Eventually, like, you know, um, a lot of the narratives that I was being told, I, I kind of started to unpack them. And I was like, wait, is that is that really true? And, you know, I think that happens a lot with kids that have grew up under some sort of, like, traumatic circumstances where it's like you kind of piece it together and people are telling you one thing's going on. And then you get a little older and you're like, well, that's that's sort of bullshit. And then you're like, well, since that's bullshit, that means this other stuff's bullshit. And then, you know, next thing you know, um, you realize that you've just been kind of fed a lie. Um, and some of it's really easy to point out, you know, um, some of it's just literally facts that what you told were happened that didn't happen. And sometimes it's more slippery than that. Sometimes it's a person trying to present, here's what, you know, our relationship should be, or here's what 
you're required here's what's required of you in the world or something and i, and I think particularly in kids that have been traumatized there's a lot of that and it takes some time to to realize what you're living through do you ever you know you you talk in the book about some relationships that you've gotten older that went awry uh because of the, the damage that had been done to you before you started going to, to, to therapy have you seen any of those people since to say hey um it was clearly me and not you or, or any of those kinds of things. You know what I mean? Because, because, because at some point you probably look back and go, uh, I made that way tougher than it need to be on that poor girl or whatever. the case. Oh, you're talking about like romantic relationships. Yeah. Yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. <laughs> one, the one I write about in the book, um, with, um, Amber, I mean, she, you know, we're, you know, we've, we're, we're not, I wouldn't say we're friends, but we're definitely friendly. And I, yeah, years have gone by of me going like, I know that was on me and she's going, yeah, it was, dude. <laughs> <laughs> yeah i know man i know well but, you know, and it's like i think if you have a if there's real love in a relationship even if it doesn't work out i think if you're if you're being truly honest there's a party that always kind of cares for that person um and so hopefully at some point you can find a space in your head and a kind of purgatory of mind to to i don't know forgive be forgiven have a little clarity and then also not, not dwell, you know, be able to have like, you know, real relationships in your life now and know that, um, uh, it's not like you're looking back so much as you're just sort of like you share time with someone. And so it's nice to know that there's, um, you, you've learned something and processed the lessons of that. Yeah, absolutely. Well, listen, the book and album are both called Hollywood Park. The book is out on May 22nd. The uh, album is out, uh, that Friday, then the, the 26th, if I'm not mistaken. I cannot, uh, uh, Friday the 22nd is when the record is out. Tuesday the 26th is when the book is out. I have actually copied that down from the internet. I'm sorry about that. I, I should be better. Um, this, this book is tremendous. Come On Out was the first single that we have heard from it. I absolutely love this song. Uh, and you've got a guitar. I'm not saying you've got to play that one, but would you mind playing something for us? Yeah, of course. <laughs> Thank you, man. I really appreciate it. It's really nice. Um, it's a nice intro. All right, this is a, a version of our song, Come On Out. Like long headlights Heading off to the city tonight At the front door Turn right I was alone, all right Right, right. I wonder what they think of me. I run away, run away. This is my town, my night. Heading off to the city tonight, and she says, "Come on out with it. Come on out with it. Come on out with it. Come on out with it." Hard words on a hot night I'll have a beer, won't you turn out the light From the front door, I could be alright I'm just running dog, 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 dog I wonder if I'll be turning like I got Twenty bucks in a pocket with my stash I'm not afraid, don't you? Good night. I'm just a shadow of a shadow tonight. And she said, Come on out with it. Come on out with it. Come on out with it. Come on out. In the night shadows watching, in the darkness approaching, you came for life in the park. So you stand on the stage at such a young age As you're feeling around in the dark And your mother, she's calling Feel your hopes falling There's nowhere to run to tonight Just the fist on your face now I hope to replace how The emptiness fills you inside Break my fall Break my fall, please break my fall, break my fall, 
Please break my fall. Break my fall. has this amazing David Bowie thing and then and I and I did say Bowie because I know how much you love him but you can hear that but then when you when you when you get to the to the end there man it, it breaks out into a little bit of that sort of like punk side of what your voice is man I love that song love it I can't wait to hear that record oh, thank you very much man and, and you're telling me that 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 the album or you're not telling me but the album is a concept record based on the book right yeah it's a soundtrack so it's the soundtrack to the book so we, I wrote the book and then the record, just sort of like, you know, Purple Rain is the soundtrack to Purple Rain or something. <laughs> sure, sure. Man, it was, uh, it was really great to, to hear you sing that song. I love it. When, when you, one of the things I wanted to ask you, I, I, I love doing interviews. It's, it's one of my favorite parts of the job. I love preparing. I love the nerves right before it actually happens, you know, like, it's like God, a I hope I don't suck, you know. Um, but, but when you... You know, in the book, you talk about meeting David Bowie. You talk about meeting Robert Smith and like drinking with Robert Smith and having kind of yeah. an evening with him. Yeah, did yeah. You did you get nervous before interviews? Oh like, yeah, one hundred percent. Especially okay. those two. Like, there's a few. There's a handful I've done. I mean, sometimes you're like, but then like, there's a handful I've done that I'm very nervous. I was nervous for David Bowie, nervous for Robert Smith, uh, Lou Reed, uh, Tom Waits, uh, probably Stephen Malcolmus even. Um, yeah. Where they, these because these were like these were like my heroes, these were like my Mount Rushmore. And so, if like yeah. you, someone who's on your musical Mount Rushmore, it's like you, you just you're, you're like, I only have a small amount of time. Also, I was a shit music journalist, you understand, I was bad at it. And <laughs> I would kind of get through like my questions that I had to ask, and then I, I was just asking about songwriting. Like, my whole thing was always to be like, How'd you write this song? How'd you write that song? What'd you do in this part? You have this bridge, kind of do this. Why does it do that? And it's because all I wanted to do was learn how to write songs, and so I used the the ploy let's say of being a music journalist uh to get what i really wanted which was advice on songwriting well you know you have completely just uncovered my entire radio career because i just look forward to meeting you guys who i love so that i can ask a couple questions i think everybody else wants to know and then i get to find out what i want to know yeah what do you want to know <laughs> <laughs> but i, I just how we do it right i mean that's the whole <laughs> You do it. That's what's that? What else is the point? But I feel like the nerves part is a good thing. I feel like if the nerves part isn't there, and not for everybody, because I know we're all wired different. But like, I think it shows that you're, you know, you're caring that you really wanted to to make it right for the interviewer and the interviewee both. Absolutely. There's a there's a saying in writing that um, the saying is no no tears in the writer, no tears in the reader, no no surprise in the writer, no surprise in the reader. So. If you're excited then and you're prepared and you're interested, then I think you're much more likely uh, to have an audience that is as well. You know, the, the, uh, and also another thing, I'm, I'm a little embarrassed to admit this, but you're a very nice guy and I think that I can. Okay, uh, sir. I was excited to tell my wife um, mm -hmm. when I finished the book and that I was going to interview you, she was like, you know you have met him before. And oh. I was like, I, I did? And she was like, yeah. Because the very first year that our station broadcast at Lollapalooza, you guys came in through the, uh, you know, uh, we were doing the media thing, yeah, yeah. and we, in passing, had said hello and got our picture taken. She found the picture. Oh, and I look, yeah, yeah. I, you, I you look see. great. I look a lot better then. Like, a lot better. <laughs> a, a lot. <laughs> Do you have it? Can we see it? Yeah, hold on here. Oh, shoot. No, because it's on my phone. Shit. I should have been prepared like that. That's okay. One. That's okay. But uh, you know what? I'll Is post it. Was it 2009 or 2014? It would have been 2009. Oh, the first time we played all of Yeah, man. Oh, yeah. way back. Yeah, that was nerve wracking, bro. 
we were on the main stage. It was like the and, and the funny things we were on right before Snoop Dogg. So we and then we shared a trailer with Snoop Dogg. And we so we're chilling in the trailer, and then it was like, all right, time to go. Because they only give you like 40 minutes, an hour of a trailer backstage, because everyone has their a second trailer back in the artist area. But the main stage trailers, there's only a couple. And he comes up, and he's got these guys, and they got these. We're just an indie rock band. We're sit, we're literally sitting there. It's like someone's aunt, with some hummus. You know, <laughs> we're, we're like wearing yesterday's clothes because we've been on tour for like five months. And so it's just like all of us, half the band is hung over, and like. Here comes Snoop Dogg, and he rolls in with these two dudes, huge guys with these crushed purple suits, crushed velvet purple suits, and just a cloud of weed smoke. Like, it was just like, it was like, whew. Was to, man, that was, that was nerve-wracking. I think, yeah, it was it was Snoop Dogg, Vampire Weekend, and us, I think, was that Well, year. and you know what I remember about that day specifically, and that time, when Snoop was on, I was trying to interview Brandon Flowers from The Killers. All oh, right, they they headlined that night. Yeah, and so it ended up being it, we started the interview before the set started, and then it kicked in, and so we ended up doing the interview with our faces about that far apart because that was the only way that we could hear, and we ended up cutting it off, and I ended up watching like a good five six minutes of Snoop Dogg with Brandon Flowers. So, yeah, you know, something good came out of it. About that show with Snoop Dogg too was to watch like fifty thousand white arms. Yeah. Well, like uh, this gangster rap thing and like and then and you could see when the n-bomb gets dropped everyone it gets quiet everyone's like hey, I'm right. <laughs> not mine to say. Around, like hey i didn't do it all right <laughs> <laughs> and that was the first time and not to talk about another band but that was the first time that i'd seen vampire weekend as well oh i love oh, vampire weekend. oh my gosh man i mean they i mean as you know, we, those dudes are um i just i think they deserve every bit of it they're just what a what a what a songwriter what a creative thing I, particularly modern vampires of the city i like the first two records but modern vampires was god every every song on that record i, I just i lived with that record for for a couple of years playing a lot and like so much originality and, and intimacy and and such deeply detailed portraits of people and i just i just think they're they're amazing ezra's amazing that guy's super talented yeah they were so they were here the last time they were here was the night the blues our, our hockey team was playing in the in game seven of the stanley cup finals oh, so i mean i i did not go to the show uh, yeah. i'll be very honest with you i was throwing beers off my back porch. i don't i don't think you need to like say why you didn't go to the vampire weekend show <laughs> not go and it's okay yeah i guess probably so but i mean there was a legit reason is what i'm saying i would have went otherwise regardless of would you mind playing another song for us if you oh, don't want yeah. to if you can't I, I get it but i'd love another oh, one. we're gonna play a few here let's play let's play a couple songs why not what else are we doing i prepared a couple things okay so let's play we we're talking about um exes so this is a song about singing about an ex every night it's an old song called off for a woman it's about the girl I wrote some time on midnight about and sort of what that process was like. All of these grateful looks, these grateful eyes, of the furious steps and the fretful sighs, promising everything to everyone. You say, I'll be back soon, you're my favorite one. You say, I'll keep it quiet, I'll hold you dear. And the whispering fills the ears, tell me you'll stay. You would have such fun. And the light don't need anyone. And the screams, wails, and calls. The headiness of the fall. Ten thousand miles from where we begin. I fell asleep with her picture in him. It was all for a woman. You say that you're grateful for all the time alone. Two years on tour, no, I don't miss home. Everyone asks you if you ever think of her. And you smile politely and you're so demure, but then all at once, your head starts to spin. And you can feel the breath on your skin, 
You find her so staring at the same spot for days. She's above you and below you in waves. And you're shivering cold like you're just ten years old. And she's lying asleep in your bed. There's a light from inside her, the darkness inside you. It's filling up the darkness in your head. It was all a woman. You've drowned in the teasing, you've forgotten the reason. The muse inspired the art. You'd give anything for her to say them once more. The words you believed at the start, you're 10,000 miles from where you began. Falling asleep, don't get you in. It was all, it was all for that churlish sign. In the man that you were, in the reflection of her eyes, the promises and the lie of a woman. Wow. In the in book, the you, you in the book you talk about the first cup, you know, the first time you played a show. And the first time that you are in behind a microphone, do you feel like there's a particular point in the airborne toxic like discography, or maybe if it was before then, where you felt like you found your voice as a writer, where you as a songwriter, like like you felt like you know what I I I, I belong here, I, I can do this. These are great songs. This is you, you know what I I'm saying. I, I think I found that about three months ago. <laughs> <laughs> Because I, I think that I, I think I felt like a charlatan a lot of my early career and that I didn't belong. Um, I'm just too, I'm like too pointy headed or something, too much of a like book nerd or something. I can't, I can't explain it. But, um, and, uh, and then I think I lost my voice. I think I had it at the beginning and then I lost it for a while because um, I got, um, and then, and then I, I think I found it again um, with this record. And like that's the truth. I don't know. I think you're not supposed to say that. And then maybe that's another. That's further evidence of being too pointy headed or something. But <laughs> like you're supposed to just play it cool or something. I'm not sure. But I, I think the truth is I had it, and then I kind of lost it. And then um, I found it again with this record. And then also another thing happened is we, we took five years off, and I didn't know what what was going to happen, and and uh, if people were going to even show up, you know. And we put tickets on sale, and we sold out our residency. It was like. Between the two show, the eight shows, it was like five thousand tickets in thirty seconds, and then, and then like the, and then our tour, we put the tour dates on sale, and it was like easily by far our biggest tour we've ever done, and it like that, and I was like, oh, and then I I remember talking to someone about it, I think it was a friend, and he was, and I think he's like, yeah, man, it's the songs, it's the songs hold up, it's they weren't part of a particular time. They were just kind of these songs, and a lot of people had experiences with the songs. Um, and so I, I think I feel I feel more like I understand my place um, in in music, and I understand what I'm sort of good at. And, and I think when I first started, I was really feeling around for like, okay, are we going to be like this post punk sort of thing, which we kind of are, and are we going to be this more like this indie rock band, which we kind of are? Are we going to be kind of this like croony post Smiths thing? Yeah, we kind of are. Are we going to do the kind of like croony Bruce Springsteeny thing? Yeah, we kind of, but it's not really any of those things. Right. It's like you go into each one of these things trying to define your shape with others, and then you stop and you go, no, here's the shape of what we are. You know, we're these four guys, and I'm this songwriter, um, and I feel way more like I understand that now, um, and kind of confident in it, and kind of cool with just doing what I do um, in a way that I didn't when I first started, where I really felt like I needed to pretend to be someone I wasn't. All right, two 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 quick things, and then I'll let you go because I've chewed your ear long enough and got. No, no, I, it's all right. I can, I'll play another song. I'll play oh, another. That's awesome. Well, here, let me. Unless you gotta go, if you gotta go, that's okay. I oh just, no, 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 no. Here, the first, and this is a this is a million dollar question for all of you guys. What is it going to take, and where will we? What will you have to see to feel comfortable to play a show 
for you know play any show to, to play what what will it take and because you know people start talking about going to see shows and i'm thinking i'm not doing that anytime soon no, like, that seems it's ridiculous right to now. I, I think um you need one of three things you either need um a vaccine which is the gold standard um two um which is the worst thing that could happen which is it's just you know two years have gone by and we have what's called herd immunity because it's just tore through the population and killed a million people. Um, which means like one way or the other, we're getting through the other side of this. It's just a question of whether a lot of people are going to die. I wish the president understood that and he doesn't. Um, and then three, uh, if you could put into practice things like they've done in Singapore, South Korea, Japan, China, all the countries where it's working, which is where you have very aggressive testing regimen. Well, you have social distancing, severe social distancing. I mean, like three weeks where not a single soul in the country leaves their house. The virus death rate would go to zero. And at that point, you take, you do aggressive testing, um, uh, antibody testing, not just, you know, the symptom testing, um, the viral load testing. Um, and then you trace everyone. And then, um, and, and what they, and it's very aggressive. It's like, if you, if you test positive, you, anyone you've been in contact with in the last 10 days, they isolate them. Anyone they've been in contact with, and they test all of them. Any of them that test positive, they find anyone. And, and this way of doing it, it tends to kind of cluster the virus. And this is why, you know, New Zealand, zero cases. Australia, zero cases. South Korea, zero cases. New cases a day. United States, 120,000 or some crazy number. You know, 1.2 million and 70,000 dead because we're not doing any of those things that countries that believe in basic fucking science are doing. It's, so that's my speech. No, no. I mean, I don't think it's a speech. And I think, I think too, Mikhail, it leaves everything as open-ended as it should be. Like, when is that even, I just can't even fathom that even making any sense right now. And God bless, I would love to go to a baseball game and a concert more than anything else in the world right yeah, now. Sounds great. Shit just doesn't make any sense. And, no. and, and, I, and I refuse to, to I just refuse. I, it just well, absolutely. The argument. the argument is this, and it's the same argument like the NRA uses. And, you know, I'm, I'm left wing, punk rock, folk rock, West Coast guy born in a commune. So just, you're going to hear a speech. The, <laughs> the, same, the same thing that happens with the NRA is happening now, which is there's this myth. And the myth is as follows. It's, hey, this is just who we are. This is, these are the rights we need to have. And because of who we are as independent people who think that you know, assault weapons should be held by any madman who wants one, we're just going to live with 35,000 handgun deaths a year. We're just going to live with mass school shootings every four days in this country. It's not true. The NRA is actually a tool of weapons manufacturers. The weapons manufacturers, the gun manufacturers, give them money to proceed and say to propagate this lie through Fox News and other channels, right wing radio. And the same thing is happening with this. And the, and the argument is, hey, this just isn't who we are. We, we're not like South Korea. We're not like China. We we need to go out and consume. We we can't be controlled in this way. We're too independent. But it's bullshit because what it really is is corporations want you to consume so they don't lose their profits. And both arguments. When you get down to it, come down to the following statement. Fuck the poor. That's what they think. They see us as plebes. They see us as people who are here to consume. And that's it. And I mean, I, I like at some point, we've got to wake up to this reality. And the thing is, the, the, the president speaks like he's on one side of the equation, but he's actually on the other. I think the thing that, you know, man, and I have a tendency from time to time to be naive. And, I, and I'll be very and I'll be very honest about that. But I said to my mom a couple of weeks ago when we were talking, it's the first time in my life where I honestly feel like, and, and, and not me as an example, but that, that, that there are people that, that just want to work other people to death so that they can continue whatever their bottom line is. No question. And, and, and that to me is just utter bullshit. There will I, never be a time. My son actually works at a movie theater. He's 19. He's not going back to work any goddamn no. time soon. Oh, no, it's, it's, it. it's not worth it. Death is not worth it. And that's the part I just don't understand, man. Like, it's death. You're not coming back. I'd rather. Oh, I mean, did you see? I mean, there, you've got all these like Republicans on, on, on the news these last two days, and then these stupid assholes on Fox and Friends that are like, we, your warriors, go out there and consume. What the kind of horseshit propaganda is this? Go out to the mall and risk dying so that you can buy a hat or some shoes or some fucking Crocs so that Crocs can make more money? Fuck Crocs. Fuck them all. Fuck those people. Stay alive. 
Do, Fuck do, you. I, don't die so that the economy doesn't lose 2% of profits. Live. Fucking live. Of course live. These people are out of their fucking minds. I, I saw a line yesterday at a mall in Atlanta, and I'm just thinking to myself, what is in that mall that cannot, that, that is so goddamn important? I just... Well, I mean, it's weird because I, I go back and forth. On the one hand, you know, I'm angry with these voters and these people who are doing these things. On the other hand, they're being fed misinformation. Right. They're, they're, you go to parts of this country and everywhere you turn, Fox News is on. And if you get into a car, it's right wing radio. And then on Sundays, you've got, you know, the pastor for the local church who's also repeating these same talking points about the sanctity of the president and this and that. And, all this, and like this. And, and so it's like people are living and it's like, OK, I'm a guy who was born in a cult. Um, I cannot fault people for believing crazy shit. A lot of people that I love believe some crazy shit. Trump supporters. I have people that I love that are Trump supporters that are in my family that believe some crazy shit. And so what I want to say to them is, guys, you're in a cult. And I, I care about you and I, I want good things for you. And you need to get the fuck out of that cult. Because you're, you're not only endangering our lives, you're endangering your own life. You're going to die. Like at this point, you're literally going to die if you keep listening to these people. And it, and, and it just, you know, man, and we could talk about it all day, but I mean, I got a 71-year-old dad, I got a 70-year-old mom, you know, man, like, you know, I, I, I just, it, it just gets to the point, man, where I got to turn the news off for my own mental health. You know what I'm Absolutely. saying? Like, 100%. because it shit doesn't make any logical sense to me. Uh. And, and, and even as a guy that, that tends to go way left, like, I, I, I think I'm smart enough to be able to, to have a bullshit meter and go, oh, wait, something is not adding up here. And I just, dude, it just befuddles me. Like, I can't watch the news around my kids because I get too angry. And that's yeah. not, I don't want them to see me like that, man. Like, no, I'm with just, you. I, I, I got to, like, limit my social media time. I got Because I'm just too mad. And, like, I, I I find myself just getting so angry that it's, like, it's not useful anymore. Yeah. yeah, yeah I, and that's I got the, the point of being a, a useful source of information for people. So I'm like, I need to, I just need to log off and go do something. All right. Well, listen, here's, here's the thing. Back to the posits here. We've got Hollywood Park, the amazing book uh, written by uh, Mikel Dole, who you know is the front man for the Airborne Toxic event. I got these days screwed up, so I'm going to get it right this time. We've got album on the 22nd of May. We've got Hollywood Park, the book coming out on the 26th of May. And guys, I cannot tell this book was such a great read all the way through. Uh, I really just thank you for writing it, man. I just really enjoyed my time reading it. Oh, that's really kind of you. Thank you. I really appreciate well, that. Well, too, and also, too, and here's another thing, and here's how you and the Beastie Boys book had in common, what you had in common, is when I got to the very end here and I read the end, I'm like, oh, shit, there's not any more. Like, like <laughs> I, wish, I, I wish there was another chapter added somewhere along the way. You know what I'm saying? So, it, it, it again, is a really good read, and when I meet you, I'm going to have you sign it so I can put it Absolutely. in Absolutely. Absolutely. That's really nice of you. Thank you. I appreciate that a lot. Cause and and if not... you don't mind, would you mind one more song before we go? Yeah, all right. How about I take us out here like in the old days? You take you take us out with the song, Jolay. All right. All right. Damn, yeah, man. I love, I love the talk. <laughs> all right, since we're talking about my folks, I mean, here's a song. It's not on the new record. This is an old song, but it's about my folks. And so let's, uh, let's see what let's see what we got. Here. <laughs> Never knew my mother, can't say it was so bad. She was just a girl of 17, the night she met my dad. He was just six months out of Chino, trying his hardest to stay clean. And they'd sing, and they'd sing, and they'd sing. Like doves sleeping with broken wings. In a bed fit for a king. Didn't mean a thing. It was a shotgun forced wedding, but they forgot to bring the guns. They were busy counting promises to all us children not yet born. No one could afford the ride, so everybody hitched up the 101. And they'd sing and they'd sing and they'd sing. Like doves dancing with broken wings. With a view fit for a king It didn't mean a thing It was a loneliness that they would confess It's like the world had just gone bad, I guess So they'd hold hands looking for the eyes of God 
And they'd say, tell me why did you hide from us? Why'd you fill this world with such wickedness? Why'd you spare us from your grace, but not the rock? Now my dad says, fuck the details, boy, just keep your head down hard. You gotta find yourself alone before you'll ever find the eyes of God. You may be broken, scared, and mad, and tear out the flesh of your heartstrings. But you were born to be a peasant, not a king. So just stop acting like you're running from something. You're gonna live the way you came without a thing. With your heart tied to your mind, tied to a string. Until then, sing and you sing and you sing. It doesn't mean a thing. Man. Man. McKellen McKellen Jolet. Jolet. The front man of Airborne Toxic Event. Again, new book, Hollywood Park, new album. Uh, coming out later in May. Uh, Mikkel, thank you so much for your time. I really enjoyed this today. I hope you My did as well. Too. Thank you so much for having me. This is All great. Right. All right, man. Take care. Good luck. I hope to see you around you know, later this year, next year, most likely, I would, oh, say, I would guess. We'll, we'll sit and have a beer and get into it. Very much, man. Take care. Yeah, bye-bye. All right, man. See you.